Amen, amen. Okay, we're going we're gonna to jump right into this. This is Exodus 24. <laughs> Exodus 24. So you got a Bible, pull that out. If you're a note taker, take notes. If you're not a note, note taker, you would need to especially take notes. Are you following that? Okay, so it's also going to be on the screen. Um, Exodus 34. I said 24. Wow, wrong right away. Exodus 34, verse 29. Watch this. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, you got to imagine Charlton Heston, right, with the two big, like it's the Ten Commandments, the stone plates. He was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. He'd been up there for 40 days and 40 nights at the top of the mountain in the presence of God himself. And Moses comes down and his face is glowing. And he doesn't know it. Not a lot of mirrors around in those days. Definitely not taking selfies, right? So he doesn't know he's glowing. Verse 30, when Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. Of course they were. This was before CGI. They didn't even have the light bulb in these days. And Moses' face is glowing. They're freaked out. You would have been freaked out too. Next verse 31, but Moses called to them. Of course he called to them. Don't run away from me because you're scared. Get back here. I've got stone tablets for heaven's sake to talk about. Talk about. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and he spoke to them. And afterward, all the Israelites came near him and he gave them the commands that the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. Why did he do that? I put a veil over his face to hide it because they were scared. And he doesn't want them to be scared. So he has to diminish the glory of God that's still lingering on his physical body. He has to diminish it so that he doesn't scare them. And that's sad. Why? Because why didn't it go the other way? Why weren't they inspired? Why didn't they see the glow on his face and say, I want my glow too? I want to go have my moment with God and my experience with God. Somebody send me on a 40-day hike with God so I can have... Why weren't they saying that? Instead, they were afraid. And we can relate to this. This is our humanity, right? We can relate to it. But he has to put a veil. He has to cover it so he doesn't scare them and they don't misunderstand. That's, that's the tragedy. They settled. They settled. See if this sounds familiar. They settled for the idea that the man of God does these things with Jesus and we just come and listen to his stories. So a friend of mine, uh, Dave Steinbeck, he's a pastor in Illinois. He and I are uh, good buddies over decades and, and he's also taking a sabbatical time this summer. Dave and Heather, wonderful people. They took a trip to Niagara Falls and they posted some pictures from their trip to Niagara on social media. And I was taking a look and just feeling the joy of that. And I'm seeing Niagara and it looks gorgeous. And I've never been to Niagara Falls before, but I'm watching all of this stuff through the pictures. These are beautiful pictures and they are beautiful pictures, but snapshots of a vacation are not a vacation. And someone else's cultivated snapshots of their great, great life experience is not your life experience. And infinity scro scrolling through the experiences of others is not a real life. Yes? You need your own experience. And of course, I'm not talking about Niagara here. You need your own experience of God. Yes. The testimonies that come out of the church and out of your church leaders. They are meant to inspire you to run to God and have your own Niagara experience as well. Amen? Amen. Okay, so I took this recent sabbatical and uh, wonderful time in Colorado and, and mountains and streams and absolutely amazing. And I, how is it not amazing? It was amazing. And, and I went and I did all the things in order to like have this space with God to shut everything off and, and simple food, like spent tons of time outside and, and just in silence and just with the Lord and all of this. And, and I'm trying to do all of the things. And, and even, in, even in this wonderful space, I'm, I'm still, weirdly, I'm still trying. You ever do that? 
Ever like want something with God and you find yourself trying, trying to spin all the dials just exactly so the Holy Spirit has to show up over here? And I think I was doing that and I had, I had just kind of the spirit of anxiety in me and, and I didn't know that that was what I was doing. I was just trying to do it right. I wanted it to work, you know? This, uh, this is a big deal. I want it to work. Um, and, and, and that kind of, that kind of talk is, is uh, achievement talk. Time with God is not an achievement, at least not for us. And so anyway, I, I spent the whole first week doing that, and it was good. There was good stuff, but God hadn't really spoken to me yet. And I got to the end of the first week and started the next week, and I remember going out, and I'm walking down this stream, gorgeous stream, and I turned this corner, and I was starting to get frustrated with God in my prayer, which is weird. He's king of the universe and all that stuff. It's weird to get mad at him, but sometimes I get mad at him. You ever get mad at him? It's, it's relationship. It's, it happens. Read the Psalms. It happens. So, so I'm, I'm getting frustrated, and I'm like, God, speak to me. It's been this long. Come on. And I think I said, come on. And right in that moment, it's like out of the blue, he just says, wait. Wait. I'm like, well, what does that mean? Wait. So before I went on the sabbatical, um, there's a family. They're actually in the room right now, and I'm not going to point them out, but they're in the room right now. They, they bought me a, a, a little black uh, uh, notebook, right, like a, a, a journal, blank journal, just fill in the pages. Here's a pen. Got a new pen, very fancy. So it's like, like I took that, and I don't write in physical journals, but I, like they bought it for me, so I kind of feel pressure. I better write in the journal. So I, so I took it with me. I guess I'll try this out. And, and so anyway, he says, wait. And so I opened up the journal and I start writing down. It's like, well, what do you mean, God, wait? What do you mean? Like, do you mean wait on God? Like it says in the Psalms, you should wait on God. Those that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagle, eagles, right? Yes. They will walk and not, not grow weary. I mean, it's just all... Like, do you mean like that? Like, I should seek him. I should, I should listen for him, seeking God. Is that what you're saying? Wait? Or, and I'm, I'm jotting down bullets and overanalyzing because it's something that I do. As I'm overanalyzing, I'm like, or does wait just mean wait? Like, it's coming. Chill out. Like, I've got this. It was never dependent on you in the first place. I've got this. You're here. It's fine chill. Let my timing be my timing. Chill. Wait. Okay. Doesn't mean that. Now I get to the end and it's like, which is it? It's all the above. It's all of it. Okay. Okay. It's all of it. So God spoke. Praise God. He said, wait. How frustrating, right? Wait. And the the truth is, the way the rest of the sabbatical went, he had all kinds of gifts that he started to roll out to me, and it was wonderful, and I'm going to tell you that story someday, just not today, but I'm going to pause it right there, because what he had me do next, because I had that journal open, he just encouraged me. He's like, you want me to speak so much? How about you reflect on what I've already said to you? How about you go back across your life, and every time that I've spoken to you in a powerful way, I want you to write it down, and I want you to reflect on that. So I I sat down, because I had time. I had a journal, and I went back to the beginning of my walk, and I just, I started tracking through every single time that I can remember that God had spoken to me in such a vivid way that it felt like I was on holy ground. Say holy ground. Holy ground. You know, like Moses stood on holy ground. Take your shoes off, because this is holy ground, because God decided to show up. Sometimes you have moments in your life where it feels like you're on holy ground. So I wrote down my holy ground moments. And I'll say this little disclaimer. It's weird to share these with you, but I'm about to share all of these with you. I'm going to give you an overview of my spiritual life. And it's weird to talk about myself so personally this way. I do it little bits at a time across messages, but I'm about to give you a lot. And the reason it's weird is because I'm not saying because God did it like this with me, he's got to do it the same exact way with you. Not at all. But I do want to show this to you Because I want you to know that when I came to the end of it and I saw the whole thing there in multiple pages in this journal, I'm like, oh God, what you have done for me. Oh God, I feel like I'm I'm the spoiled kid in the family of God. 
I've gotten all the goods. Thank you, Lord. Like, I can't believe you have spoken to me this much in this kind of a way. Why did you pour this stuff out on me? Thankful. Thankful. He's so good to us. And he wants to reveal himself. He is kind. So 1993 is where I'm going to begin. And I know half of the room wasn't even alive. Okay? Like 20 of you are going to hit me after the sermon and say, I wasn't even alive then. I know. 1993. I, I came to Christ in 92. And I was 18 years old. And I'd grown up in, in church, grown up in religion. Didn't realize it was religion. And by religion, what I mean was it was all about me doing all the church steps in order to achieve something with God. And weirdly, I still stayed the old me in all that. I had never surrendered to Jesus. There was no love. There was no relationship. All of a sudden, at 18 years old, I surrendered. And it all like, it's like someone turned the lights on in the spiritual room. <clears throat> that was 92. So 93, there's this moment where, and I've talked about this before here at this church. Maybe you've heard about it. But um, we were learning about the Holy Spirit. We were learning about spiritual gifts. And there's this thing in the book of Acts where they would lay hands on somebody, which is not violence, by the way. It's just they would put their hands on their shoulders or on their arm. And just like this was a way of like, we're praying for you. We're right here with you. Like there's mentoring involved in that, all this kind of stuff. But anyway, they'd put their hands on them and they would pray a special prayer and say, God, fill this person with your Holy Spirit. Maybe even give them spiritual gifts that they never had before. But it's, it's really this act of total surrender. Like, I want to be totally empty, and I want God to fill me 100% with him. There's a verse in the scripture that says, eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. So you don't say, oh, that stuff, that's for somebody else. Eagerly desire the spiritual yes. gifts. Yes. Which means we should have a posture of, God, whatever you want for me. Yeah. Even if it's weird. Whatever you want for me. And so that's, that was that moment for me, and, and I, I was in a dorm room, right? And, like, they're praying for me, and, and you know, anyway, the, the Spirit of God fell. And all of a sudden, it's like words came from over here in my mind. And they just said, uh, why are you striving, question mark? Rest in your faith. Those were the two phrases. Why are you striving? Rest in your faith. Why are you working so hard to earn something with me? You know you got your salvation, but sometimes when we get saved as Christians, then we think, now I've really got to get to work, and I've got a Bible enough, and I've got to pray enough, and I've got to church enough, and I've got to do all of the things in, in order to keep God happy with me from day to day. And God saw that spirit in me, and he said, why are you striving? Rest in your faith, because what Jesus did on the cross is enough. Amen? Amen. It's the whole thing. So he saw that in my heart, and that's why he said that. It was a big deal. Also, 1993, a little bit later, I'm walking around and I'm having time with God, and I take walks because I'm ADD, and if you put me in a room with a Bible and I just try to pray, I'm not going to pray. I'm like going to do tasks, and I'm going to think about things and make lists and stuff like that. I've got to walk in order to keep moving. The movement helps me focus somehow, so whatever. So that's how I pray. I'm walking all around my college campus. And I go through a, there's a parking deck and I take a shortcut through this parking deck. And when God speaks to you and you have a holy ground moment, by the way, you kind of tend to remember exactly where you were when it happened. Because if you didn't bawl your eyes out crying when it happened, it's a surprise. It's just, it, it, it just, it's, it's a moment. So anyway, so I'm in this parking deck and I'm walking along and I'm praying and I'm frustrated with God about something. There's something I'm praying for. If you were here last week, if, if you don't get it the first time, just keep praying, just keep praying, just keep praying. Yes. So I was doing that and, and I was wrestling with God. I was getting frustrated with God. God, why won't you? And in the middle of it, he said, you are Jacob because you wrestle with God. stops you in your tracks. He just made an identity statement about me. You are Jacob because you wrestle with God. Because there's something about your character and the way that you walk with me to where you hold on and you won't let go until I bring the blessing. And there's a whole story about that in the Old Testament. And I've taught on that before here. The reason I taught about it is because it was deeply personal to me. And if you're, if you're a big Bible nerd this morning, you're like, well, Jacob doesn't actually mean wrestle with God. It's when he was renamed to Israel. And that means wrestle with God. I know, I know all of that. 
And it took me a lot of like studying, trying to figure that out. But what God was saying was not that, that, that my character is in alignment with the, the meaning of the name Jacob. It's that it was his character. That's why he renamed him. Anyway, all of that, I wrestled with God. 1994. Um, there was a guy who had approached me. His name was Bill. He was a pastor. And he wanted to mentor me, enter into what's called a discipleship relationship with me, kind of a Paul and Timothy kind of a thing. And I wasn't sure about whether or not to do that. And I was praying about it. And I was in this little, um, <laughs> at, the, at the campus that we were at, they would have these rooms and they were sound isolated. And so if you were in a vocal music class, you could go in there and sing at the top of your lungs and nobody could hear you. And I was in one of these vocal classes and no, it has not helped my vo voice at all. Um, I still don't sing solos and shouldn't ever. But anyway, so I was in there and I was doing stuff and I was praying because no one could hear me. And God came in and said, why won't you let me heal you? And it's like he took the question and he flipped it because I thought it was like, should I enter into this mentoring relationship? And he asked the question back and the way he put it was like, there's healing for you. You're here and you won't let it happen. Why won't you let me heal you? Okay. So I entered into that relationship with that guy. And I got incredible things about grace into my life. And I've told that story also before that I was challenged in that mentoring relationship to step away from all these remnants of religion that I still had in my walk with Jesus. And I started to experience grace in a whole new way. And do you see how they're starting to be connected also? God's got themes that he's trenching through my life spiritually. 1998, there's a a guy, a friend of mine, Paul, he's getting married and he, instead of a, a bachelor party, he wants to have a camp out in the Blue Ridge Mountains in West Virginia. And if you're hearing John Denver, so was I. <laughs> <laughs> so we're there and it's gorgeous, you know what I mean? And we're camping out and cooking over a fire and doing all this kind of stuff. And I, I'm having my time with God out there in the woods and, and uh, which could have been scary and I didn't think about those things at that time. But I'm just walking out there by myself and letting myself get lost and no cell phones and all that kind of stuff. And anyway, while I'm walking out there and it's just this gorgeous surrounding and stuff, I decide I'm gonna build an altar, a physical altar. So some of you have read about altars in the Old Testament. Whenever they had big moments with God, they would build an altar. And what it means is they would gather all these stones together and they would build kind of a, a pillar or something like that. And it kind of represented in that spot, like I had this moment with God here. They're all over the Old Testament. And so I started to do that. And do you know, it's a lot of work to build an altar. <laughs> <laughs> and I did not have the muscle tone, nor do I today to build such an altar. And so I spent hours out there just pouring sweat, trying to like drag all these rocks into a single pile and none of them would stay and all this kind of stuff. And it was a big, dumb, clumsy mess. It was a barely a pile of rocks. You would have just laughed out loud at me at the end of it. And I plopped down on the ground just in frustration and I just started to pray. I just felt like God came into the moment and he didn't need that from me, by the way, even though those are beautiful and you should build one for sure. But what he, what he wanted is he wanted me to surrender. And so I just said, God, everything in my whole life, I surrender to you. And if you ever call me, I will go. Whatever you tell me to do with my life, with my money, with everything, I will do it. And I rededicated my life to the Lord right there in that moment. So I didn't get a word from God, but I had a moment with God. Does that make sense? Amen. Next one is 2001. Um, so Linda and I, uh, she was pregnant with Jacob. Um, so we didn't have kids yet or anything like that. We were leading a life group in our church back in Illinois. And, and the elders of the church sent me a letter and said, we would like you to join the eldership. I was 27 years old. And I read through that letter and I laughed out loud and immediately threw it in the trash can. Because I'm like, how could I be a church elder? I'm just way too young, no life experience, anything like that. Nothing against you 27-year-olds in the room. But I just didn't feel it at that time. And as soon as I threw in the trash can, again, a word from God said, what did you read this morning? And I'd been in God's word and 
I'd read Jeremiah chapter one. I had to go back and find it and look it back up and like, what in the world is he talking about? And in the midst of Jeremiah one, it's the call of the prophet Jeremiah into ministry. And Jeremiah says, no, God, I can't be a prophet because I'm too young. And then God responds back and says, do not say you are too young. Oh. And then the verse says this. This is God speaking to Jeremiah. He says, stand up and say to them, whatever I command you, do not be terrified by them or I will terrify you before them. Did you just threaten me, God? (laughs) Maybe. And then the very next thought is, Linda's pregnant. What's Linda going to think about this? And Linda, no lie, minutes later walks into the kitchen where I'm at And she said, I was just having time with God, and he told me that you're supposed to be on the eldership. Literally. She got got it. She didn't even know it was a question. Okay. Uh, Some disclaimers. I've got more of these to share. Some disclaimers. Make this super, super fast. Um, Are moments of God speaking to you like this the pinnacle of the Christian life? Not necessarily. See it like this. These are great moments. Like you eat three meals a day, hopefully. You get your nutrients, right? You're eating regular meals. Nothing fancy maybe, but you're eating your regular meals. Every once in a while, you have a steak dinner. And if that steak is cooked right, and it's, it's medium rare, and it's not over seasoned, and you actually taste the meat itself, and it's a life-changing experience. Where my steak eater's at. Can, amen. Yeah, it's like when, when all that happens, it's a moment. And you remember the steak dinner. But the steak dinner is not your daily sustenance. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's, it's not one or the other. It's both and. So in the Christian life, you should be in God's word all the time. Like multiple times a week at least. You're in God's word. You're not waiting for Sunday. You're listening to God all the time, right? And you're doing that and you're praying the same kind of a way. You're listening to God. What's, what's he got to say to me? You're having the friendship, having the interaction. That's your daily meals. And then every once in a while, God comes along with a holy ground moment and blows you away. Amen. And it's wonderful. And it's so good. But here's the thing. Sometimes when God speaks to you, you get it wrong. And so do I. That's a twist, yes? Because some of you guys, you're like, yeah, it's great when pastors talk about hearing from God. That's so great because they make it sound easy. They make it sound simple, and it never is with me. Because sometimes I think I hear from something from God, and I wonder if it's the pizza from the night before. <laughs> or I wonder if I just talked myself into something because I feel so strong and passionate about this thing. And I wonder that this thing that I felt like I got in prayer, was that actually God? How do I know that it's actually God? And I totally get it. And part of it is what you are doing in between because you're reading God's word and you're hearing how he talks. And here's the deal. I have thought I heard from God and it was the pizza the night before. I, I have talked myself into things. And there's times that I did think that I got something from God and I read in the Bible later and I'm like, oh, what I thought I got from God is wrong. Because whenever I get something from God and then the Bible says something different, Bible wins. Bible wins every time. (laughs) That's how it's got to work because he's Lord, I'm not. He speaks perfectly, but I got bad ears sometimes. And so what you gotta do, it's like, I know I'm making it sound complex, but it's not. What I'm saying is you have to discern, discern. Yes. And, it, and, and I know, I know it's work and I know it's a process. I know it takes time. So you know, I've been trying for a week and I can't get God to speak to me. It's like, it might be a lot longer than that. Like it, it's, it's a process. So like take your hunger, for instance. Linda and I are working with a uh, nutritionist coach right now. And we're, we're, we're loving the experience, but it's not just about what you eat and what you don't eat. Sometimes it's whether you eat at all. And so here's what we're learning. This, this, again, I never knew this before, but I, I thought it was simply, if I'm hungry, I shove food in my mouth. They're like, no, that's not it. If you're hungry, the question is, what kind of a feeling is this really? Because sometimes you have a feeling of hunger because your stomach is empty and you need to fill it, yes. But sometimes 
you're having a sugar crash because you had a sugar spike. Sometimes you ate the wrong food that puts you in a spot, and all of a sudden, weird, unnatural cravings come in, and now I've got to eat more, more carbs, more sugar, whatever the thing is. And they're like, you've got to discern that's not hunger. I know it feels like hunger, but it's slightly different from hunger. You've got to build the discernment to know the difference so that you can say no to that one and yes to this one. Amen. And sometimes we're choosing to eat because of stress. And you had a really bad day, and so you're reaching for Rocky Road ice cream. Bluebell, anyone? Come on. Because what? Because it makes me feel better. But makes me feel better is not the same as I was hungry. Yes? I, I, as I grow up, I have to discern the difference in, in those feelings. And as you grow spiritually, you have to discern the difference between, was it the bad pizza for the night before? Did I talk myself into this one? Or was this God this time? And sometimes I get advice from spiritual people I trust. Sometimes I go to God's word to confirm it. Sometimes I don't know till 10 years later. The ones I'm telling you today, I can look back on and I know they were the Lord. I hope that makes some sense to you today. Holy ground. Next, 2005. Um, my lead pastor, Bob C., approached me one day, said, I, need, I want you to leave your technology job. I want you to become a pastor full time. It was, as you can imagine, a really big deal for us. We weren't sure about whether or not we should do it. We prayed long and hard about it. One day, God spoke to me and said, you becoming a pastor will be like you going home. This is the way he put it to me. Never thought about it that way. And I can look back on it and say, yeah, it was like going home for me. And this is my spot. Um, never forget that moment. Uh, holy ground. Your holy ground might look different than mine. I'll say this too. We have different gifts, different personalities. So I'm giving you ones where God spoke this big word to me, right? Your holy ground moment might be when you were in worship one time and the spirit of God came and filled you so overwhelmingly that tears started to fall and you couldn't stop them. And all you were doing was singing a song. And you're like, I look back at that moment and I know I stood on holy ground, okay? So it's not just one way. There, was, uh, there have been times that I've sat at people's deathbed and I've held their hand while they went from physical life into eternity. And I knew I was on holy ground. And it's weird and you're like, well, that's a really morbid thought. But when you, when you go through that with somebody and you know that you were there to love them in a moment like that, it's eternal. And God's there, holy ground. Your, your holy ground might look different than mine is the point. Um, next, 2010. Um, I, I talked about this back in, in January. There was a group discussion we had as a church staff back in Illinois. There was this moment, somebody asked the question, they said, um, not why did you go into the ministry, but why did God call you specifically into the ministry? What was God's motive in calling you? And I was about to give some Christian-y answer to their question that I had thought up. And before I could, God pressed in and gave me words. And he said, the reason I called you into ministry is because this path was the only way that I could heal you and free you from the stuff that's got you tied up as a person. Amen. So I'm a pastor for me. No offense to the rest of you. <laughs> I love you, but I'm a pastor for me. That's, that's the way my father did it for me. Next, 2017, there was, a, there was a, a time some things happened and Linda and I became convinced with a lot of guidance, a lot of wisdom from other people that our time as pastors was done in Illinois, at this church in Illinois that we were at. And so we knew it long before we actually made the move. It was actually two or three years before we made the move. We knew that we were leaving that place, but we didn't know where we were going to. We'd never set foot in Oklahoma before, at least I had never. <laughs> never heard about Grace Fellowship before. So anyway, so we're praying about God, what's next? And all these things are going, all these moving pieces and stuff. And I'm driving one day between Morton, Illinois and Washington, Illinois, and this windy road. And I hit this valley and all of a sudden God spoke and said, I'm sending you to a land of milk and honey. I know some of you Lawtonians, you're like, really? <laughs> all right, track with me. I'm sending you to a land of milk and honey, but you will have to build it, is what he said. But you will have to build it. 
And some of you know from the scripture, the land of milk and honey is what Canaan was, the promised land where God took his people to. And milk and honey is important. Why? Because you need milk to survive. You need sustenance to survive, but you don't need honey. Honey's joy. Honey's blessing over blessing. So I'm taking you to a land of milk and honey. That's what Grace Fellowship is going to be. I didn't even know your names yet. But we're going to have to build it. Okay, let's go build it then. And that's when I knew I was called out. Um, next one, I came here later that year, 2017 in the fall. Came here for my very first trip, uh, my interview. And I was here all day long. And at the end of the day, I asked one of them, I'm like, what's, what's the best uh, grocery store to get good fresh produce in town? And they told me, and I'm not going to say the name to you because I'm not going to plug them, but they've got the best fr- produce in town. I'll just say that. And I went there. And um, I grabbed the stuff that I needed and I went to the checkout lines and you know how all the checkout lines are there and then they've got this really big kind of aisle um, that runs perpendicular to it for you math people um, next to it where you stand out to decide what line you're going to go into, you know? You're in that open space. So I'm standing there in that open space, not thinking about anything. And for some reason, my my eyes go to this one person, this guy who's in the line checking out his stuff. And the voice of God comes into my mind and says, ask me for that guy what? That's weird. You're like, that's weird. It's weird. I know. Ask me for that guy. Like, I don't own people, God. Let me ask me for that guy. So we'll pause theologically over here. Let's, let's make this okay for you. Um, I had to look this up, but there's a spot where Paul says, to the weak I become weak in order that I might save some. Yes? So Paul says that even though Paul definitely knows he doesn't save anybody. Because you can't save anybody's soul, not as a person, only God can, right? No one comes to me unless the father draws him, Jesus says. And then Jesus has to do his thing. The Holy Spirit has to do his, that's how people get saved. Not because we do anything, but what Paul was saying there is he's just using shorthand. He's like, I want to present the gospel to some people. And then I want to see them get saved by God. He says, in order that I might save some, he's just using shorthand. Anyway. I'm in the grocery store. God says, ask me for him. What God actually meant was, ask me for a person to shepherd and take care of. Ask me for them. Okay, God, will you give them to me? I start to get teary. And then he points out someone else and says, now look at them. Ask me for them. Now I want you to ask me for them. And I want you to ask me for them. And I'm standing there. Nobody at that grocery store knows what I'm doing, but I'm sitting there asking God for all of these people because I don't know where they're at or where they're at in their life, but I know they need Jesus. So God, would you bring them? God, would you bring them? And I just start asking and I start, I start instantly feeling responsible for these people in Lawton, Oklahoma. I don't know. I don't know their names. I don't know if they're going to come to Grace Fellowship. I haven't even been offered a job here yet. And God's calling me here. He's given me responsibility for people. Uh, 2019, um, I'm praying in the car. I'm really mad at God again. Do you see a theme? I do that a lot. Mad at God again because we're trying to do things here at Grace Fellowship and we don't have enough volunteers, enough leaders in order to make this stuff happen. And I'm like, why doesn't this work? And God, you got to send me people, send me people. And he says, if I want it done, I'll give you the people. Boom. If I want it done, then I'll give you the people. You never have to be afraid if you know what my will is, what I'm doing here, that the people will be there to see it done. So either A, you need to wait. Well, there's lots of options there. (laughs) There's lots of options there. If I want it done, I'll give you the people. That was comforting to me, faith building for me. Um, And then in 2023, I went to Colorado and he told me, wait. Look at that. Could I just say, if you ever have opportunity and you're in a store and there's an empty journal with a pen, maybe grab one and maybe sit down and say, God, would you show me what the holy ground moments are in my life? Maybe I could write these things down. Maybe I could be inspired. Maybe I could be reacquainted with the great kindness of God because I feel like I'm the spoiled kid in God's family. He's just poured out so much. 
Behold the kindness of God. Okay, last thing, and then I'll let you go. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 7. It says, 50 men from the group of prophets also went and watched from a distance as Elijah and Elisha stopped beside the Jordan River. You're like, whoa, right turn. Two prophets in the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha. Old prophet, young prophet, right? Like old prophet who did all these miracles, Elijah, like he raised the dead, he healed people, he called fire down from heaven onto an altar. He did all this crazy stuff. And then his Padawan learner is Elisha. For you non-Star Wars person, that's like a protege, right? The person he's mentoring like is Elisha. He's the young guy. And if you grew up in the church, Elijah and Elisha always got you confused. Get over it. It's okay. We're just going to read about them. These two guys, old guy, young guy, right? Old guy is about to get sent to heaven in a fiery chariot. Not technically it's going to be a whirlwind if you've read it, but there's a fiery chariot involved. Okay. Then Elijah, old guy, he folded his cloak together and he struck the water of the Jordan River with it. And the river divided, and the two of them went across on dry land. So he takes his coat off, and he smacks the river. This is the Jordan River where John the Baptist is going to baptize tons of people. This is a good-sized river. He smacks it, and it parts like Moses in the Red Sea. This is a big deal. And these two guys walk across. In verse 9, when they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what you want. Uh, tell, tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken away. Like, like do, you have, do you have a final wish? Elisha replied, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor, which is super bold. Do you love the boldness? He's like, I know you're pretty great, but I want to be double you, big guy. Oh, I love it. Okay. So then the way the story goes is, is old guy, Elijah is carried up into heaven and there's a fiery chariot and a whirlwind and he's, he's taken up and all this kind of stuff. And then verse 12, Elisha saw the process happening and cried out, my father, my father, I see the chariots and charioteers of Israel. And as they disappeared from sight, Elisha tore his clothes in distress because he was still sad that his old mentor was no longer with him. So he's got a cocktail of emotions. Make sense, everybody? Verse 13, Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak because it had fallen, right? Which had fallen when, uh, when Elijah was taken up. And then Elisha returned to the bank of the Jordan River and he struck the water with Elijah's cloak and cried out, where's the Lord, the God of Elijah? And then the river divided and Elisha went across. So he, let me just read between the lines here. So the old prophet's gone. He asked for a double portion of his spirit. He grabs his cloak and you know he's staring at that thing. Like, is this actually going to work? And he walks up to that river. How much anxiety was in that little guy? I got to think a ton. If it were me, because oh, it's one thing when the master is there, but he's all alone now. And I love his question. He says, where's the God of Elijah? He doesn't say, where's Elijah? He says, where's the God of Elijah? Because even though Elijah's up there, I can have my own thing with him. I can have my own thing with God. Because that's what it was about all along. And like he takes that and he doesn't just smack the river. He says, where's the God of Elijah? Are you here? Like, oh, don't miss that. Because he's demanding that God show up. You got to feel his emotion in it. Because he makes the cry and then he smacks the river and it parts. Oh, the Hollywood movie that would be. Oh my gosh. But I love the heart of this guy. Because he is unwilling to see Moses go up the mountain on his own and to stay behind afraid. He says, no, I will have my own experience with God. And he demands it and he gets violent about it and he chases it down. And which are you? How, how old are you, Christian? When was the last time you cried uncontrollably because God so moved you? The, the point of the stories is not so you hear somebody else's story, like snot, snapshots of their Niagara trip, and you're like, that's so pretty. You did not have an experience. Go get your own experience with God. Let me stir you to jealousy. Let me inspire you. Go get it. Because it's before you and he wants to meet with you. Will you? You're like, I don't know. I don't. 
I don't know how to dial, dial the dials with God and make the things happen. It's not about making anything happen. Practically, it's not about making anything happen. It's not, not about you being moral enough. It's not about you cleaning your life up enough. It's not about you doing the right things supernaturally to like earn a thing from God. It's not about any of that. But the still small voice does tend to get heard by those who quiet themselves. By those who wait. By those who seek. Why? Because God's a gentleman. And he doesn't force his word on people who don't want to hear it. He just doesn't. It's a law of relationship. Right? How do relationships work? You take some steps toward them, and then they decide if they want to take some steps toward you. And you take a few more toward them. And it just goes like that, doesn't it? It's supposed to. Otherwise, it's forcing things. And the Lord wants you to get quiet. And the Lord, in your silence, as you, as you force the rest of life to finally quiet down and just to be with him, what he's looking for is not effort. What he's looking for is for you to, through your actions, say, they don't have the answers for me. Only you do. They do not have the fulfillment of my soul. Only you do. They cannot heal me. YouTube cannot heal me. Say it with me. YouTube cannot heal me. It can't. None of that stuff can. You have to shut it off and you have to declare with your action, God, I'm listening for you. And watch what he does. So what are you doing, old Christians? How long has it been since you wept? Do you look back at these holy ground experiences and say, yeah, I was really awesome 20 years ago when God used to do that in my life. Go after it. Demand it of him. Get mad. Amen? Would you guys stand? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, only you can do a spiritual work in anybody. Only you can revive us. Only you can take a heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh and get us started again. And so, God, I'm surrendered to you, and I ask that you would do a supernatural spiritual work in the hearts of these people, God, gathered here today, even the folks online, God, with them as well. Jesus, you see us, and you love us, God, and you want so much more for us. Help us to be a little bit demanding about it, Lord. We love you, Jesus. In Christ's name. Amen.